Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who bets on JV football. He is the very broke captain. I don't want your life. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening, and thanks for telling a friend. This week we are drinking Scissor Kick by the Beer Ninjas over at Kings County Brewers Collective. This is a double dry hopped IPA featuring a massive mid-air karate style edition of Simcoe hops. They also use something called X14, which is a fruity new experimental hop grown exclusively on Long Island. Garage grade a big four and a half bottle caps out of five. And this week we are practicing high karate. Because of our good garage friends right here, first up, a huge thank you and cheers to Justine and the KCBC team out in Brooklyn. Yeah, and somebody that likes a little naughty karate, Megan from Kettering, Ohio. Next up, we have Landon and Lauren from Sanger, Texas. Landon and Lauren love listening to TCG while road tripping. There's a cloud with a vein and it's bleeding on me. And a big we like your jib to Lori in Vancouver, Washington. All right, Captain. Next up, we have Kristen in the far off Alaska. And last but certainly not least, we have Stephanie up in Markham, Ontario, Canada. Everyone that we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com. That's our website. And they donated to this week's beer fund. And for that, we very much thank you. And for everything true crime, check out our website, truecrimegarage.com. You can donate to the show. You can buy a t-shirt. You can sign up on the mailing list. You can add to the blog. You can do whatever you want (laughs) at truecrimegarage.com. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Ashland County warn of a passing train, a tragedy averted. The sights along County Road 1181 warn of a tragedy committed. White ribbons have been strung in memory of Amy Mahalovic. Amy's body was discovered right alongside 1181 last week. The ground has been scraped by investigators for soil sample analysis. Another portion is covered with flowers left by shocked residents who now have more personal reasons to help in finding Amy's killer because he was bent down, so I couldn't see him that well. Larry Schuster has told the FBI an amazing story. On the day Amy's body was found, Schuster says he saw a suspicious-looking stranger drive back and forth near the discovery site, and he claims the driver looked very much like the police composite sketch of Amy's abductor. As I was leaving, coming up towards 224, that's when I seen him going back down again. Back up, I think he was coming up this way to see what was going on and see if anybody found him, found the girl. Amy Mahalovic is one girl this community will never forget, as a card on the flowers proclaims from the people of New London, Ohio. We're sorry, Amy. There is not only a sense of pity being shown by the people of Ashland County, but also a sense of precaution as well. Even though many neighbors tell me, in their opinion, Amy was probably killed someplace else, they say they plan to play it safe, just in case her abductor is still in the area. This is the land on which Kenneth Myers spent much of his life as a grain farmer and a frequent hunter. He says he now has frequent thoughts about Amy. I told my wife the other day, I said, you know, you see this on TV all the time where they go out in the, in the country and find a body. I said, but you never figure it's going to happen right in your back door. Myers claims children are being watched more closely as well as property, while the community awaits the arrest of Amy Mahalovic's killer. In Ashland County, Jack Marshall reporting for the 10 o'clock news. All right, we have three more suspects to get to before we wrap up for this week. Now, I know which 
one I would like to end the week on. So two to choose from. Where do you want to go next, Captain? Do you want to talk about a suspect who has been on my mind a lot lately? Or would you like to talk about the people's suspect, Dean Runkel? You know how in wrestling they got the people's champ? Well, I would would call Dean Runkel the people's suspect because anytime we've spoke about this case, Hailing that, from parts unknown. That's Dean the guy. Runkle. Yeah, that's the guy that we get the most emails about or the most blog posts about. Well, let's talk about the the first guy because he's been on my mind too. Okay, so the the suspect that's been on my mind a lot lately is Kenneth Robert Stanton. He was a one time Moraine, Ohio resident. He pled guilty to thirteen molestation cases. He received sixty years in a Georgia prison. Now, back in the 60s, Stanton was charged with sex crimes involving children and committed to a state hospital in the state of Michigan, from which he escaped. He later was caught and arrested and recommitted. He was diagnosed at the time as a criminal sexual psychopath. Years later, he was declared to be fit to live in society and released. Now, I know a lot of people are going to relax. You know, maybe laugh at those weird statements being back to back like that. But look, in the 60s and the 70s, a lot of states did operate that way. They believed that this type of stuff could be, you could be rehabilitated and they would issue you back out into society. Now, let's get into him in detail because he's very, very interesting for many reasons. Now, in 1989, he was molesting young girls who were home alone. This is believed to have started in Jackson, Mississippi. He would pretend to be either a police officer or a food safety inspector, right? He's using this method to get into the home with these girls that are alone. Yeah. He's using a ruse. Yeah. He would knock on the door. Basically he would, he would follow these girls around, make sure that they're going to be home alone, knock on the door And he's presenting himself as an authority figure, a police officer or a food safety inspector, giving them reason to one, trust him and two, to let him into the home to look into whatever it is he's claiming he he's there for. Once inside the home, his typical MO was to blindfold and molest the girl. Now in the summer of 1989, one of his victims began screaming so loud from inside the home that Stanton was scared away. A neighbor boy heard the screams and this draws his attention to what's going on. Right. And he sees Stanton fleeing the property. Mm -hmm. The boy, God bless him, wrote down Stanton's license plate number. Got him. Yep. He gives this to the police after the girl calls in the complaint. And then later, once they have his, you know, driver's license photo. They have some photo of him. Mm -hmm. The girl identifies from that photo Stanton as the assailant. Rather than be arrested, he flees the area. He was suspected of assaults, not only of several in Mississippi, but also in the state of Alabama and Georgia as well. His car, his vehicle was found abandoned in Ohio in December of 1989. So first let's think about his timeline for a bit. We have him molesting girls, young girls, nine, 10 years old. He's using a ruse to get into their home. And then once he's caught for this or suspected of this with, with two witnesses, two eyewitnesses, he flees the area. And that is in the summer of 89. Now his vehicle is found in December of 89. The thing here is you have to fill in the gaps, but we know that his vehicle was found abandoned in the state of Ohio. So that would put him somewhere in the area. Now, let's think about his previous crimes in M.O. for a minute. Right. Right. He's molesting these girls. He's using the ruse, using a ruse to get into their home. Right. He's a criminal sexual psychopath, as they labeled him. He's using a fake identity on a girl home alone, and the victimology is similar. It's so similar. In fact, it's girls of the same age living in nice neighborhoods. Yeah. But fear not. 
Because then the FBI adds Kenneth Robert Stanton to their 10 most wanted list. And then one of True Crime Garage's favorite old shows, Unsolved Mysteries, featured the Stanton case on the October 24th, 1990 episode of their great show. Maybe you could help solve a mystery. That's right. And some people were able to help solve a mystery because viewers of the show started calling in with tips that Stanton was living in a trailer park in Moraine, Ohio. Mm. Well, Captain, guess who else was watching Unsolved Mysteries that night? Who? Uh, Well, the pervert on the run, Kenneth Sicko Stanton, saw his face on TV. So Stanton took off again. And Stanton is smart and scared enough to run, but like a behavior that we've discussed several times on this show, he can't help himself. His addiction owns him. Mm -hmm. It controls him. He is addicted to molesting young girls, to victimizing girls. Yeah. So even you'll see this with all types of, of criminals, repeat offenders, serial offenders, sexual predators, Mm-hmm. That no matter what situation they're in, no matter how scared they are, or if they're already running from law enforcement, if they see someone that fits their victimology and an opportunity to assault, rape, kill, whatever it is that they are into, because they're so absolutely addicted to their desire, result, and outcome of that victim and that opportunity. So just five days after Stanton flees from Ohio, after seeing his face on TV, Mm -hmm. he sees an opportunity, a nine-year-old girl, and he can't help himself. He tries to molest her. Thankfully, he's unsuccessful and he is arrested. Well, let's let's think about this for a second because you have killers such as like Dahmer, which will say that he he did this thing and and he he killed a guy and he's never going to do it again. We... We hear these guys talk about their urges and how they're trying to control them, and and there were it's almost like a drug uh, addict, you know. If you read like Miles Davis's book, he'll say, "And that's the last time I did heroin," and and then the next page is, "And then I was in New York doing heroin," and it's very similar to some of the stuff uh, Ted Bundy would talk about. But again, remember when Ted Bundy was on the run in Florida? It's almost like um, this stress, the heightened stress, makes the addiction stronger with these individuals. Yeah, it's 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 exactly as said, an addiction that you can't you can't get away from it, and the the longer you are from it, the the more it increases. So, as said, he thankfully he is unsuccessful. This attack leads to his arrest. This all takes place in a motel in Rock Hill, South Carolina. So once again, on the run. Ultimately, Stanton ends up pleading guilty to 13 molestation charges, receiving a 60-year sentence, eligible for parole after 40. But we can throw a parade because Stanton did die in prison. This was in August of 2011. So he's no longer a threat to communities. There is no threat that he will get out of prison. He is thankfully no longer with us. Right. Stanton, Got him. the reason why I like him for several reasons. Okay. One, he doesn't look unlike the composite drawing. Right. Two, he is already known to have been using ruses that were working. He's already trained himself to the level that his ruses are working to get into the homes of these individuals. Now we've talked about how these serial offenders, whatever crime it be, they are learning through trial and error. And what got him caught was being in the home of the girl that he was victimizing. Yeah. She's screaming. Somebody from the outside hears these screams, alerts them to, Hey, something's going on. And they see this grown man running out the door, running through the yard and getting into a car. And that boy was smart enough and had the wherewithal to write down this creep's license plate number. So you're saying... I'm saying maybe he adapted, and rather than knocking mm-hmm. on the front door, now he's going to use the telephone to enter their home. Yeah, you have to get out of the house. I got to get the victim to come out of the house. I got to get them to me, rather yeah. than me going to them, because me going to them is what almost got me caught. And now I'm on the run. 
I'm up here in Ohio somewhere. Well, isn't there a bunch of speculation that uh, the perpetrator's car would have been like maybe in an alleyway, but probably that he didn't actually park in. If you look at pictures uh, of the plaza where he picked up Amy at, uh, it looks like there's a little parking lot in the middle. Yeah, you you could have had Amy walk just a short distance before you would be not visible to most and have your car kind of stashed there. Right, so you create this ruse to get her out of the house. The problem, though, is you're still putting in her into a public area, but then you're able to move your car out of the way and, like you said, a little walk and, and nobody's ID in the car. Right. Right, and one thing I've wondered about, too, is that if at some point did... You could switch ruses completely when you're talking about a 10-year-old, right? So you you tell them at one point that you're you're going to take them somewhere that they may want to go, go shopping, buy something for their mom. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some money afterwards. That is your ruse. But at some point, if she if she f starts to figure you out or or if you just want to change it completely to take to take the lead, you could present yourself as an authority figure. You could say something to this child of, look, you met a stranger at a location mm -hmm. and you left with them. You're in big trouble here, young lady. Right. You're in big trouble. If your parents find out about this, you're going to be in big trouble. I'm a police officer. I'm undercover and we're doing these type of operations and you could present yourself as some type of authority figure. It wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility. We at some point, what we do know and can surmise, just based off of simple logic, at some point she knew that whatever he, you know, the shopping trip was not going to happen. At some point she right. knew he was not who he says he was, and at some point he took control of the situation. Now that could have been seconds before she was killed. It could have been hours. It could have been days. But we know that that happened at some point, and that's why I go I go to him because. The ruse that he was using at the time is not terribly unsimilar to what was used against Amy. Mm -hmm. But I think the problem with Stanton, as good as a suspect as I think that he makes and as good as a, well, as terrible of a human being that he is. I mean, Man. we already, the difference Peace. between, oh, shit. Well, the difference mm -hmm. between him and several of the other suspects that, that are often brought up is he is a known pedophile. He right. is a he's been convicted multiple times on multiple accounts. We know that he is in fact this. In fact, somebody that would be looking for a victim of this age and her gender. The yeah, problem the I, problem is can you put him in the immediate area that day or leading up to the abduction? That gets very difficult to do because this man was already on the run. He's not He's not got a permanent address on paper, right? Right, and that's a, that again. But that makes me that makes him a better suspect in my mind, since he is on the run. That he has been able to have the ability to find locations. So the fact that you know it took so long, um, I mean, what was it? Almost three months between the abduction and when she was discovered. Correct. This person would have. Uh, the know-how uh, to find a location and and possibly have her there alive for a while. Um, yeah, as terrible as it is to say, this Stanton, mm -hmm. sicko Stanton, he would have been skilled at this. Right. Unfortunately, I mean, yeah. he, it's it's not his first time. Now, the other thing too with him being on the run, Captain, that makes him interesting is. Does he really need to be accounted for that day, that evening, the next day? You know, we we don't right. we don't have we don't even know where he was. Right. Um, we know he was on the run, but he fled in the summer of eighty nine. We know that his vehicle was found in Ohio in December of eighty nine. And then later we have reports that he was still in Ohio, in mm -hmm. Moraine, Ohio. Yeah. In October of nineteen ninety. So we can't really put him in the immediate area on October 27th, 1989, but we can put him in the state of Ohio for the, uh, the time of the abduction roughly and 
the whole time that she was missing. So he's, he's an interesting suspect. The, again, the issue becomes how did he get the phone numbers to contact these girls? How did somebody on the run, somebody unfamiliar with the area, no ties to the area, mm-hmm. how would he have come into communication with, with Amy plus with the others that received phone calls that were connected to Amy's case, right? In Amy's case and in others, I'm not going to say all, but it has been reported that the phone numbers were unlisted. So it's not as easy as some have pointed out where they say, well, you could have just been driving down the street and saw a potential victim and followed her home and said, oh, they live at 123 James Place. I'm going to get into the phone book and try to find that address and phone number, and now I can call that number. It's just, it wasn't that easy in, in some of these cases. So Stanton looks good because he would be the type of offender that would carry this out. The issue again is putting him there at that time and giving him the, the knowledge he would need to carry out a ruse that was similar to he had in other cases. Well, and like you said before with the other suspects, law enforcement saying they don't believe some of those suspects are capable of a crime like this. Law enforcement is definitely probably saying, hey, yeah. he's capable of this More crime. than capable, yes. All right, we're back, you filthy animals. Every one of you filthy as hell. <laughs> Um, okay. So captain, now let's get into Dean Runkle. Our Dean Runkle info Mm -hmm. obviously has several sources, but the main source, uh, for the first part is a bombshell article from the Cleveland scene titled person of interest. The FBI finally has a top suspect in the Amy Mahalovic murder. And this of course, by James Renner. And the article is from 2008. Now the article starts off by repeating statements from an eyewitness on the day Amy was abducted. This states that the eyewitness saw a man walk up to Amy, put his hand on her back. He leans down to whisper something in her ear. Then the man puts an arm around Amy's shoulders and leads her away. This eyewitness is Amy's age and describes the man as Caucasian. His hair is thick. He is wearing a beige windbreaker with plaid lining, front pressed khakis and a button up shirt. We'll come back to this eyewitness in in a bit. The article states that just like Amy, at least three others received phone calls similar to the one that Amy said she received before she was abducted. As we've commented over the years, this number should be debatable. We've seen higher numbers, but the words directly from law enforcement are that they believe there were two or three calls related to Amy's case. The girls... In this article, of course, now they're, they're grown up. These girls went to school in North Olmsted, Ohio. North Olmsted is about a 15 minute drive South of Bay village. So not far away. And more importantly, the two towns would have shared the same area code 216. This is important as it is believed that the call to Amy that set up the arrangement to meet at the Bay square shopping center came from Amy's area code. Remember, we talked about billing and how billing was conducted by the phone companies back in 1989. Right. Everybody who hears this case at the first, they go, well, why the hell didn't they just trace that call? They were only billing long distance calls differently than local calls. So there's no record of local calls because they don't bill for them. They just Mm -hmm. charge you for the monthly service. Same goes for these other two or three calls. They would have come from that 216 area code. Now that is still a huge area. That's still a large population. But when we're talking about a case that has gone unsolved for 30 years, we have said how many suspects there are. This somewhat at least shrinks that pool a bit. Mm -hmm. Let's take that info and go exploring, shall we? So let's say those calls are in fact connected. 
that the caller to the three girls in North Olmstead is the same man that called Amy. Mm -hmm. So now this means you need to find a link between these four girls, Amy included, all of whom we should mention were 10 or 11 years old at this time. The link could be a person, place, a club, or an organization. It could be anything, but it needs to connect all four girls and this unknown suspect. The article states that in early 2005, an agent working the Amy case contacted the girls from North Olmsted. The agent wanted to know if the girls went to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center. They had. And in fact, the article claims that they each went there in the weeks leading up to Amy's abduction. Amy, too, went to the Nature and Science Center, but the article does not specify when her last visit was or how close to her abduction the last visit would have been. That information may not be known to anyone at this point, including the police and FBI. But what we do know and can say is Amy had been to the center before and on multiple occasions. Keep in mind, this center is close in proximity to both her school, her home, and the Bay Square shopping plaza. And based off of where the other three girls attended school, Amy would have lived closer to the center than all three of them. The three girls were asked if they remembered signing in at a check-in or a logbook by the front doors of the center. Mm -hmm. This being writing their names and phone numbers in this book. This question received a mixed response from the now grown up girls. But keep in mind, this is 15 and a half years later. Right. Eventually, at least two of these now grown women contacted James Renner, passing along that they had been questioned about their possible connection to the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center back in 1989. Then a man contacted Renner about someone he was told was the suspect that the police may have been asking about. A man who once had volunteered at the Nature Center and who was a science teacher Back in 1989, that man was Dean Runkle. Dean was born in New London and grew up not far from where Amy's body would be found, just a little more than three months after she was abducted. This is most interesting as retired special FBI agent Phil Torsney, who is currently active on Amy's case and has been for years, stated that he believed that Amy was transported out of Bay Village after she was kidnapped as the town is too dense, too close-knit to be a likely place to commit murder. He stated that the murder likely took place in Ashland County, which the murderer was probably familiar with. Runkle was born in 1944. After high school, he attended Bowling Green University, majoring in education. He got his first teaching job teaching science at Sailor Way Middle School. This was in 1967. He earned the Young Educator of the Year Award while teaching there. He was also a pretty good ragtime piano player, good enough to play at Cedar Point for a regular gig during the summers. In fact, one point, he quit teaching and played piano at Disneyland for two years. Yeah, eventually he went back into teaching. Yes, and then he did quit again in 1987. At this time, he returned to New London and moved back in with his parents. He got a job working at a pet store. It is said that when the store, when the store's mice population became overwhelming, Runkle donated mice to local nature centers. Some have said he very likely gave some to the Lake Erie Nature Center. So if the Lake Erie Nature Center and Science Center is in fact the link between these four girls, Amy included, and if the calls were in fact connected, Dean Runkle would have been someone probably linked to the center during that time. In the fall of 1989, and just side note, we all know Amy was abducted in the fall of 1989, Runkle applied for and was hired at Horde Junior High in Amherst, Ohio. Runkle continued to work there until 2003, and after that, he moved to Florida. Now, earlier, we spoke about the young person who saw the man approach Amy that day. 
outside of the shopping plaza. Now, over the years, this eyewitness has been shown many photos of men and asked if this man looks like the man you saw with Amy that day. Right. It was reported in this article that when this witness was shown a picture of Dean Runkle, the response was, there have not been many photos that have been this close. I would definitely tell them, meaning law enforcement, to investigate this guy. This is interesting for several reasons. We have one of the eyewitnesses being shown a photo and saying, hey, this, out of all the photos that I've seen today, and out of all the photos that I've seen over the years, Mm -hmm. this guy looks the closest out of all the photos. I would tell investigators to look into this guy. The weird thing about Runkle is we know that he was a teacher. And there have been many people that have gone back and tried to, well, not tried to, they did interview former students of his. Mm-hmm. Just like some of the other, other suspects that we've discussed today and on yesterday's show, it's really a mixed bag of opinions about this individual. There are some that say, you know, Dean did some weird things and he was a weird guy. He was odd. He was even creepy at times. He said some strange things. Well, like... T- to handle rats that's weird but then there were other there were other kids that had the you know very extremely positive things to say about dean runkle saying that he really inspired them to continue their education and inspired them to go into teaching themselves Mm -hmm. or really got them to take a strong interest in science and some in biology and some of the things that dean was doing in his classes so again a mixed bag of opinions about his nature and his yeah, behavior but, right but just to be clear you could be you could have sick fetishes and still be a good teacher or a good uh, worker well yeah you could be you could be the best guy in the world one minute and then be a total you know a-hole the next mm-hmm. i i don't doubt that at all but the reason why i point that out is there are so many things out there that just straight up label him as a creep right and I think, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to label him a creep, I think that's hard to do on our show because I'm seeing mixed opinions by, by, you know, his students throughout the years. Right. But as, out of all the suspects, when you see Dean Runkle's picture and you see the sketch, you go, well, there's your guy. I mean, this is, it almost looks like a drawing of his of his picture what i would label the third composite sketch yes right there there again is where i think we have a problem with there being a composite sketch out there or the the fact that there was there was four of them that's what i'm getting at he where you would say he looks like the third one you may not say that he looks like one two or four right so right that's that's where that composite sketch gets a gets a little weird now also the other thing too is this individual, and I look, I believe her statements. If she's saying this is the closest that I've seen since then, I don't doubt that statement at all. I don't doubt that she believes that to be true. The other thing we have to keep in mind along those same lines, though, this she was abducted. Amy was abducted in October of 1989. This witness saw this man for a very limited time at the plaza on that afternoon and then is seeing this photo of Dean Runkle 19 years later. Right. In 2009, the Cleveland scene ran another article. This one is titled New Witness to Amy's Abduction IDs Runkle. It says, and I'll just read the first part of this article because it's not a long one. For nearly 20 years, Rick Burns waited patiently for the police to return to his auto body shop across the street from the station to show him photos of the man he saw with Amy Mahalovic the day of her abduction. But they never came. Burns maintains that a strange man with shaggy hair parked in a sedan in his personal space, closest to the Bay Square Plaza on October 27, 1989. He remembers the date because it was also the day he brought in his newly restored truck to the shop to show off to his buddies and was miffed to find that somebody had parked in his spot. Burns says the strange man later pulled around the shop to the pumps where he was standing. In the back seat was a young girl. He believes to have been Amy Mahalovic. 
The man asked Burns for directions to I-480 and then left. Two days after Amy disappeared, FBI agents came to Burns' shop and to look through receipts for the previous two months. They took his statement, and that was that. He never heard from them again. Now, Burns reviewed a series of photographs of suspects and non-suspects. Without hesitation, according to this article, Burns picked out former Amherst Middle School science teacher Dean Runkle as the man he saw at his shop that day. Basically, this is an eyewitness statement saying, within days of the abduction, I gave a report to police that I saw a man, shaggy-haired man, asked me for directions, and in the backseat of his car, I believe was Amy Mahalovic. Right. I then waited for nearly 20 years for them to come back and show me pictures of possible suspects. They never came back. Wow. All right, where do we start here? Because this looks bad for Runkle on the surface, but when you really kind of start scratching and clawing through this statement and through this article... Look, I believe this article was written with the best of intentions. I also believe that Rick Burns is is a good guy and means well and means the best for the situation and probably is just simply trying to help. Yeah, but who's the article written by? Um, I believe it was written by well, th- there's there's multiple reporters involved in this article, so I don't wanna I don't right. wanna cite anybody specifically without having all the names. But what I'm getting at here, Captain, is we now have a very public statement by the Bay Village Police Department that says that kind of contradicts the statement given by Rick Burns in this article, okay? So their statement is, yes, we did talk to Rick Burns within days after Amy's abduction. Yes, he gave a statement. He, his statement at the time, says he didn't see anybody. He didn't see anything suspicious. He didn't report anything suspicious. The article says He reported something suspicious and then waited nearly 20 years for the police to return to ask him questions again. Bay Village Police Department are also on record saying that Rick is a very good guy. He's done nothing but try to help this investigation. But the problem is they're going to believe his statement that he gave within days after the abduction and not the one that he came back to give them nearly 20 years later, which they say is a different story. I've not seen the police reports. I've not seen their notes. I've not seen the case file. I do believe everything they're saying, though, for several reasons. I do believe Rick Burns is probably a good guy that only wants to help. I also believe that he probably believes somewhat what he's saying now, saying that he saw. Just misremembering it, it probably wasn't Amy, and it probably wasn't on the day in question. Right. And the reason why I say that is for several reasons. He says... The girl that I saw in the back of the car, I believe she, it was Amy Mahalovic. Well, if you're saying that within two days of the abduction, one, if you believe that prior to that statement, if you've already made that connection in your mind prior to that statement, you should have gone to the police yourself to give that statement, right. not waiting for them to come to you to look for receipts, receipts and then ask you questions. Right. And then on top of that, if you firmly believe that that is, in fact, what you saw, then you don't wait for them to come back to you. You remind them, hey, I have information that I've passed along. What's going on with this? Yeah, and I think with Runkle, there's a leap to kind of figure out how he got the numbers to make contact with these girls. If they are connected, Uh, the Nature Center, I don't think there's 100% proof of that. I think the tough thing about Runkle is that he passes the eye test of one of the the drawings, and I think that's hard to, for people to get around. You see those pictures side by side, and you go, well, that looks like the guy. And I, I think people have a hard time uh, moving on from that. So, I mean, there are some other suspicious things with Runkle. I mean, you said that, and you're exactly right in your statement of, we can't 100% connect him to that nature center. And some are saying that the Nature Center is kind of the intersection between these girls and the killer. Where where that gets a little skewed is we can't 100% put him there. However, it has been reported that he has, that Runkle has made some incriminating statements in regards to his involvement or possible involvement 
with the Lake Erie Nature Center. Again, we don't have 100% proof from law enforcement stating that he was a volunteer around that time, that we can put him there within the weeks or months leading up to the abduction. He does have a general knowledge being from the, the roundabout area where Amy's body is found was found, and that seems to be a general consensus amongst the experts in her case that the killer, the abductor, knew that area, that there was something familiar or something something that is of bigger importance to the killer rather than just driving and driving and driving and coming to a place out in the middle of nowhere and dumping the body. So there is a connection there as well. Right. Um. But again, I'm I'm with you, Captain. It's uh, loose. These are loose connections. Some of them seem a bit of a leap. We would be remiss if we didn't bring up a rumor regarding Runkel. And I state this as a rumor because I've seen people try to prove it either way, and I don't know which to be true, right? The other rumor is that at some point in his teaching career, they became aware, the educators became aware that they did not have Runkle's fingerprints on file. And this is something that's standard practice throughout the state of Ohio. Right. When they learned this, and he wasn't the only one, there were other teachers throughout the state that they did not have their fingerprints on file. And what they did was to try to bring their records up to date. They went around to all these teachers and said, hey, we need you to go down here and get fingerprinted and we're just going to add it to your file. No biggie. And... The rumor is that when approached with this request, Runkle, who was close to retirement, who was close to collecting a pension, retired without notice, without pension, and that he just left very quickly after this request. Yeah, that's very fishy. There, if that's true. There are people that say that that is not, in fact, true. I can't prove it either way, and that's why I took you, and that's why the captain took you through his work history. We know when he was employed with the state of Ohio as a teacher, and we know when he was not employed. Now, Amy was abducted in 1989. He didn't, you know, he continued to work there until 2003. It probably wouldn't be that hard to figure out if there's a connection between him and like Opers or something. And if if he is receiving some kind of, uh, you know, pension for from the state, and that would kind of clear up that rumor. Well, and I, I think... You're absolutely right on that, but I've seen people with two different claims in both stating that they have evidence from the state of Ohio to back up their claims, and they're saying opposite things. One is saying he retired without a pension and retired abruptly. Well, we just need somebody then, that works at Oprah's to be a little shady. And, and then the, the other saying, in fact, he continued to work there and submitted to their request. So I can't say for certain which one is right. You're right. Uh, somebody that's on their lunch break at Oprah's, give the captain a call. Mm -hmm. He's available. Or send me an email and then just tell me <laughs> tell me the information. <laughs> and I know you're breaking the law and you might get fired for it, but chances are you're not going to get caught. Those records might be public record at some point. They might be. They might be. Okay. Well, can we move on from Runkle in, in a sense that yeah. As much as we could from any of these suspects. Old Bunkle Runkle. Mm -hmm. Right? I think all of them look good in some form or fashion, and they're all being presented this week as suspects that we believe that is, if anybody gives a shit that the garages list, these people would be in our top 10. You know, there are reasons we see to dismiss some of these suspects, but also plenty of reasons to keep them on the list as suspicious characters. One thing that I think we should include on our top 10 suspect list would be the unknown male theory. And in actuality, this theory may have the highest probability out of any of the suspects. So one of the lead in detectives on the case back in the day, we already discussed him, Jim Tompkins, said, quote, of all the suspects, 20 to 25 were most interesting, but we have never had the sense of, yes, this is our guy. Authorities believe the unknown male is still out there and there are ways to catching him. There are several ways, in fact. 
First are the things Amy had with her that day. Amy had these things when she was taken. After all of these years of searching, none have ever been found. Some are rare enough to be memorable and unique enough to be clearly identifiable. As we have said before, it is not unusual for this kind of criminal to make the arrogant error of keeping a memento of his crime, a trophy. If the unknown male kept one or more of these objects, even for a short time, someone might have noticed. The more distinctive of these items is a pair of shoes. When her body was found, Amy was dressed almost exactly as she had been when she disappeared in October, but forensic investigation has confirmed that she was not simply seized and slain. She had eaten again, and after, she was taken, so she ate at least once. The experts are certain that her clothes had been removed, then put back on her body after death, all except her shoes and her earrings. The shoes were uncommon. They were black leather ankle boots with vertical rows of silver studs. Some have theorized maybe the killer had a problem getting them back on her feet. Yeah. He either tossed them out or maybe he kept them for a period of time. Now, Stephen Etter says the earrings are even more likely souvenir items. They are particularly important, just the kind of things the offender might give to another female. They were tiny blue turquoise silhouettes of horses' heads. According to Amy's mother, they were mounted on gold metallic studs. Amy also had her school backpack, which was a fairly common blue denim design with red piping and black plastic buckles, and a plain white nylon windbreaker. The last item, Amy's dad gave her this black leather folder with a brass clasp on it, and it had the Buick 3 Chevron logo and the legend Best in Class on it. This is a fairly unique item as well. Another thing that could get this individual apprehended is actions and behaviors of this unknown male, a tip needed from someone in the public to put law enforcement onto the right guy. Here are some notes from the Thomas Kelly Cleveland Magazine article. This is from the experts regarding the makeup of this unknown male. Obviously, because his identity remains unknown, these are simply theories, not facts. But they state that some of this information, when he is finally caught, will be remarkably close to much of the description provided by FBI experts. They go on to talk about the suspect composite sketch that was released and saying, Remember the undistinguished drawing of the slightly built man, unremarkable in appearance? They say, forget it. At least set it aside. Because it could be that the poster man is not an accurate portrayal of the unknown male. They say this is very possible because the eyewitnesses would have had no reason to scrutinize this man. There was nothing extraordinary about his actions or appearance. Wren emphasizes that people should not hesitate to contact law enforcement if they have some information, but the man doesn't look like the drawing. And he goes on to say, I cannot say that strongly enough. Even if you suspect somebody and he doesn't look like the drawing, regardless that there are four of them out there, contact law enforcement. Yeah. They go on to state that the offender, what they can say for certain, right, is the offender is a white male. At the time of the crime, he is believed to be 25 to 35 years of age. This would have put him, if he was in his late 30s or to mid 30s, would have put him older than the average for first time child aggressors. They state he is not remarkable in appearance. He's within average ranges of height, weight, and build. He may look presentable, but not accomplished or professional. He is socially marginalized. According to Etter, not in the mainstream, not a run-of-the-mill citizen. He won't fit in with his peers very well, especially women, and the people who know him will describe him as odd or difficult. It's likely that he was living alone with a single roommate or maybe still at his parents' house at the time of the crime. It is most unlikely that he was in a successful marriage with a normal home and family life. One of the most intriguing aspects of the report 
is that the killer was most likely to have undergone some sort of dramatic change in his behavior, personality, or appearance in the weeks preceding the crime. He developed a sudden compulsion or obsessive disorder, experienced a personal catastrophe or an emotional setback. He may have started drinking heavily or stopped drinking suddenly. He may have gotten into hard drugs or quit a drug habit. There was a drastic change in his life, maybe a sudden fascination with a cult or radical religious group. Dick Wren says something happened to this man in the fall of 1989, something that would have been noticeable to close friends or relatives. There was a pre-event stressor, something that took him from fantasy to action. This may have been reflected in a dramatic change in his physical appearance. He let his hair grow long or cut it very short. His health suffered. His weight fluctuated. There were changes in his appearance or lifestyle. In addition, one important logistical aspect should be noted. This man was not passing through. Authorities are confident that the unknown male has reason to know this area. There is the need for such a predator to select a hunting ground where he can move comfortably through the tall grass. Another expert explains that the Ashland County location is just as important. This was not random. When you are disposing of something that could ruin your entire life, you are going to be careful. The unknown male knew County Road 1181. He had been there on that lonely stretch of asphalt before. He knew he could quickly place Amy's body just over a shallow ridge a few yards from the pavement and expect that it would go undiscovered for weeks or maybe even months. Wren confirms this conclusion, saying, Yes, we think he was familiar with Bay Village and familiar with the area in Ashland. The experts go another step, saying, We believe he had knowledge of the family, personal knowledge in considerable detail. I could go on and on with this unknown male theory. I do think that this is one that deserves to be on the list. A lot of people were out there going, well, you didn't make it through 10. Of course we didn't make it through 10. There, this is such a huge case. And we still have some suspects that we would like to vet a little further to see if they should fall on our list. I think the ones that we covered this week are very good suspects. They, they should be and are on other lists out there. Yeah, I think they're the most popular. Yeah, and and this case, along with several others out there, but you don't see this in a lot of cases, I would describe this case as having a tornado of suspects. There, there are so many of them out there, and when you try to wrap your head around it, you can't because it's like, it's like on the Wizard of Oz when when Dorothy is being taken away, and you can she sees uh, the farm hands for a little bit, then right. she sees the witch for a little bit, and then she sees yeah, and that's what this case is like. It's a tornado of suspects. When you try to focus on one. There's one, another one that will fly by and pop in your mind, and another will come up here and there throughout uh, your time on this case. Now, there are some truly great sources for information on Amy's case. Unfortunately, when a case is 30 years old and 30 years unsolved, many different people have had the opportunity to take a look at it, offer their opinions, expert opinions, and tell the story of the abduction and the investigation. We have bitten off a big chunk of that. I think in our coverage on true crime garage now at five episodes dedicated to her case. But if you need some more, and if you want to know where some of this information came, some of it ripped right from the pages. Uh, we used sources like the plain dealer magazine. This was in October 21st, 1990 issue where they featured an article called Amy by Michael Heaton. We obviously talked about the Cleveland Magazine, October 1998 article titled Who Killed Amy by Thomas Kelly. There, of course, is James Renner's book, Amy, My Search for Her Killer. And there is also Who Killed Amy Mahalovic, a podcast by our good friend Bill Huffman. So there are plenty of sources out there. At some point, if there is some new information, we will revisit Amy's case again and probably again until this thing is solved. I will say this, though, Captain. Coming up on the 30-year marker of that tragic day, of that terrible day, right. 
I find myself, after looking into this case again within the last few weeks, of a restored hope. I, I wasn't going to, you know, when we covered this in June, just before CrimeCon, I said this to a few people at CrimeCon, mm-hmm. and thanks to everybody who made the trip. I said this to a few people at CrimeCon, but I, I refused to say it on our show, and I told you this off mic. At that time, I had lost all hope that this thing would ever be solved. And I, I, I just want to throw it out there that that's how I felt at that time. And I want to throw it out there that within the past few weeks, that hope has been restored. I'm feeling better about this case as we're moving towards that 30 year marker. Well, I think it's, that's one of the reasons why we, we cover these things to try to get the word out. I think it's going to come. Information is going to come from a, unlikely source and and that's going to lead us to some answers nick do we have a recommended reading this week why of course we do captain this week we are recommending the blood on my hands by shannon o'leary this is an autobiography but it's a story about her family and a story about her and unfortunately it involves horrific abuse and a terrifying murder that played out behind the scenes of her family life. So check out The Blood on My Hands by Shannon O'Leary. You can find that title as well as a bunch of other ones if you go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the recommended page. And until next week, be good, be kind. And don't you dare litter.